Hey, everybody. Welcome to another React Wednesdays. So for those of you that are new, React Wednesdays is a weekly stream we do. Basically, we bring in cool people from the React world. We talk about interesting things. My name is TJ Van Toll. I work as a developer advocate at Progress. With me, as always, Dan Wilson. Dan, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. My name is Dan Wilson, and I work with Digital Primates. We do Enterprise React Consulting, and we curate the Enterprise React Newsletter. So if that's your kind of thing, Google it, sign up. We'll never sell your email address. Awesome. Well, I want to bring up the site, uh, telework.com slash React Wednesdays. I'm going to toss this in the chat as well. Just to give a quick shout out to upcoming shows. So if you join us next week, we're going to be talking with my friend Paige Niedringhaus about large React app development. And I've seen some of her stuff already, and it looks pretty cool. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. And we've got Tanner Lindsley coming on in two weeks to talk a little bit more about React query. So that should be fun as well. And we also have some, some interesting other uh, talks that are, that are in the works. So you'll have to stay tuned to that. And as always, I remind you, you can add React Wednesdays to your calendar using this link up here on the site. If you want to get reminders about such, uh, just keep an eye out on what we're talking about. Today, yeah, though, it's a, it's a bit of an accident, but we're talking about you know using React for enterprise apps this week. And then next week, we'll also be talking about techniques for doing enterprise apps with React well. And so that should be very interesting and accidental, but we actually mean an on-purpose <laughs> series. It's, a, it's almost like we planned it this way. <laughs> So today, though, today we have a pretty fun episode in store for you because we're going to be talking about this article here. So this is by Razvan, uh, and hopefully he'll tell me if I pronounce that correctly, about an article he wrote called, I almost got fired for choosing React for my enterprise app. And if you haven't seen this before, I'm going to drop this in the chat so you can look through this. And to talk about this, we have, first of all, one more member of our panel. I want to add Michael Labriola here, returning champion, Michael Labriola. <laughs> Howdy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a little chilly here today, but other than that, um, I'm making it through. It has been chilly up here. Uh, do you want to tell the chat um, for people that haven't seen you before, who you are, what you do, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. Michael Ariola. So I'm also with Digital Primates like Dan, but um, I've basically been in and around enterprise apps. Oh, I'm going to say for too many years, but in the 20s, we'll just throw that out there. Um, <laughs> but in particular, I've always had a long focus on bringing um, sort of modern front ends to enterprise apps. So that's taken way different roads um, from JavaScript away from JavaScript back to JavaScript again. Um, over the course of time. But yeah, so I, I work with clients and I mentor a lot of big enterprise organizations through their adoption of, of new front end technologies. So that's how I spend my days. Awesome. So with that, let's bring on Razvan. And Razvan, am I, am I nailing your name? Did I at least get close? <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. No, you, it's, uh, it's really good. So it's Razvan, you, you did a good job. Awesome. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. Well, do you want to... <laughs> Do you uh, want to tell chat, like, um, I'd be curious. So like, first of all, I, I, who you are, what you do, that sort of thing. And then maybe if you could also give a background of your article, you know, what inspired you to write it, what the response has been, that sort of thing as well. Yeah, sure, sure. So I'm uh, Rezvan. I'm living in, uh, I'm software architect in a company uh, located uh, in Romania. If you heard about Transylvania, I'm, it's, it's a big possibility that you heard about Transylvania. Well, it's a region in Romania, and I'm right in the middle of it in a city called uh, Cluj Napoca. Um, maybe I can give you a bit of background uh, about my technical background, actually. So um, I started as uh, 10 years ago as a .NET developer for like three or four years. Then I switched to Java for a couple of years. Uh, then I did some um, uh, some Python, and then in the past three years, maybe more than that, I was mostly focused on front-end technologies. So now I do have background for uh, Angular, React, and Vue.js. Uh, also, a bit of uh, Aurelia. It's uh, the spin-off uh, that came up from uh, from Angular. It's yeah. it's, quite, it's quite fun. Um, and uh, the company that I'm working for, well, it's an it, uh, it's not a product company, so we don't have our own product. Uh, it's mostly an outsourcing company, which means that we are basically helping some other companies, our customers, in uh, implementing their uh, custom uh, custom solutions. And uh, this is very helpful, at, le at least for me, because I have the chance to work with so many projects, with so many customers. And uh, that's why yeah, I ended up uh, writing this uh, this article, right? Uh, and related to the uh, uh, to the article, well, 
Um, at, at, at that moment, I wanted to just share the story uh, about uh, okay me doing some mistakes while uh, uh, implementing a, a web application for one of our customers. They wanted to migrate from a, a big monolith from WPF, which is a desktop uh, technology, so, and they wanted to migrate to a web uh, application. But they so a, they they also had a, 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 a team, an outsourcing team, but they didn't have the, the expertise in implementing web applications. So that's how uh, my company uh, got into the game. So we were supposed to start. Uh, uh, the project uh, stay for a while, maybe one year, and then after that, the entire uh, application will be um, uh, will be continued by uh, uh, the company, which was, at that moment was located in in India. And uh, what actually triggered, because this is a, an old story, it started like two years ago, but it uh, I got triggered uh, in December when one of our customer we we did a proposal for them. So we said, okay, you should go with uh, Angular. They wanted to migrate the uh, Adobe Flex uh, application, and you know that Adobe is not supported anymore uh, in the browser. So uh, in the end, they decided, okay, it's it's time to to move on. And we said, okay, it's a, a data driven application. You should go with Angular. And they said, no, it's React because we. <laughs> Notice on a lot of blogs that that's the way to go is the fastest, the best, and and so on, and uh, that actually triggered the you know triggered me to to write this article and and tell the story. I'm so glad you said that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, have you ever heard of Adobe? Was it Flex? <laughs> Flex. Yeah, yeah. I may have a bunch so, of screenshots with your face on all the books. So I, yeah, I may have. I may have. I may have done something with that before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I actually I really like what you just said. By the way, about the about why you were triggered. Um, yeah. I don't use this anymore, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story anyway, if you don't mind for a second. Which is, uh, when I used to hire developers and when I would um, interview them, one of the very first things I would ask everybody is, okay, so I want you to build me an application. What design patterns are you gonna use? And people would give me lists and lists and lists of framework and design patterns, and only like one out of ten would ask me what the application was supposed to do. Uh, but mm -hmm. all of them had ideas of exactly how it should be architected and what technology we should use first. So I think your story is fantastic. Um, and by the way, as somebody who has expertise on both sides, Angular is a way closer fit to Flex than React is. Um, and right. if you weren't going to try to learn new skills, uh, but I think that's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful segue in everything that's going on. We also have some Adobe Flex love in the chat too, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is amazing. Flex was really great technology at the time. It was ahead of the curve and you could do great things in the browser. It just, right. you know, as things happen, you know, it declined yeah, so, and, and we're in a new phase. It's actually, so honestly, it, oh, go ahead, Sarah. What, 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 uh, what actually happened is that, uh, yeah, it's not supported even, even in Chrome, it's not supported anymore. So what we did as a temporary solution was to actually embed it inside an electron <laughs> and then uh, ship it away with oh, uh, yeah, that's uh, the desktop application, so the users can still use that app. Uh, that that app that was being built like ten years ago, so it's not yeah. so easy to migrate. Right? Yep, that's uh, that's fantastic and uh, an interesting solution. Yeah, uh, Flex Flex was ahead, was definitely ahead of time. There's still honestly a couple things you could do in Flex that you can't easily do <laughs> in modern frameworks. But uh, unfortunately, as we all know, Flash Player is is not only just rumored to be dead, but uh, officially um, <laughs> finally removed from most uh, operating systems without some serious work. Because we do still have a couple clients that still have Flash things out there, and now it is an increasingly difficult thing to figure out the right way to configure your system to temporarily be able to figure out what's going on with their system. So that's always fun. So about the article, first of all, I've got to give you, we were talking about this earlier, but I got to give you props because like this is one of the best blog titles I've ever seen, right? Like this is just asking for, for <laughs> clicks. I think both because like it's, it's intriguing because you, it does entice people to want to read more, to know your, your reasons, but also because I think mm -hmm. I think you hit on something because this is a super common thing that people are concerned about, right? If I'm building an enterprise app, like you don't want to pick the wrong choice, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, so I think you, you, you hit on something that's quite common. And right. so what I'm hoping we can get out of this chat is like some perspective on this. And especially for people, like if you and chat are, are facing this similar sort of thing, feel free to chime in with questions and things that, that we can talk about and discuss. But I think maybe what we could do is 
um, you divided this article pretty nicely into a series of sections. So I was thinking yep. we can go through just one section at a time, talk about these points, um, sort of with an eye on how people can sort of learn from the experiences you went through and through some of the other experiences we've had in this panel as well. So does so that make sense? Um, does that seem like a good way of attacking this? Yeah, yeah, I feel I think that <laughs> we should do. We All right, so where you left us was the client had a Flex application. They were .NET developers, and they decided React is the best thing in the entire world. We're going with it, and you're supposed to be on the project for about a year until the internal team can yeah. sort of take everything over. Is that right? Okay, so so what happened? Well, we, we started um, the way we are usually doing. We start with the proof of concept, so we validate all the aspects like, okay, is it able to render... One million records. Is it able to have animations? You know, all all that stuff. So it was a, a really nice proof of concept. But then the the other team uh, was supposed to join. We had a a, a knowledge transfer plan, um, but unfortunately that was not, yeah, actually uh, run, because uh, what happened is that the other team um, came, uh, saw the project, uh, had a look over the code. And uh, they wanted to adjust it uh, a bit. Well, it's pretty easy to say adjust it because basically what they wanted to, to do was to actually use all the .NET that, uh, patterns that they, they were using before. And uh, they wanted to apply it to the new, uh, to the new uh, project, which is pretty common, I would say. Um, I, I think it, it also has a name. It's called uh, Golden Hammers, right? So you have <laughs> yeah. have a good expertise uh, using one technologies, and you want to use it uh, everywhere you see it. However, I think this is more applied to uh, technologies, not for the guidelines and patterns. So for that, I I I know another uh, technical solution is called Gypsy anti pattern, because you know gypsies are usually living in the tents and they are moving from one place to another. But when they get into the into a house and live into a house, they set up a tent inside the house because <laughs> that's the way they are used to to live, right? And the same thing applies here. I would see it's a good uh, uh, a good way to see it because yeah, they want to use the same guidelines and, and apply it to the uh, to the JavaScript world. Yeah, and the... this, <laughs> I think this is happening most a lot of time. Um, even when you're, for example, uh, moving from, from Java to .NET, maybe this transition is a bit better because they are pretty similar. It it's a way harder when you switch the the uh, the platform. So from for example, for from the back end, we switch to the front end. Well, in that sense, it's uh, there are a lot of things that uh, that needs to be changed, right? And you yeah. have to adjust to adapt with the new patterns. I, in a sense too, like this story to me, like I've seen it in like the rise of TypeScript. Cause I think one of the reasons TypeScript is so popular is there are right. so many Java and .NET developers out there that want some more of the structure that they're used to in those, those languages and TypeScript gives them almost like a path to get there. Um, but I, I know what you mean too. Cause I come from, I've, I worked in a Java background for several years and I saw the same thing happening in you go to the front end world and these Java developers are trying to write classes and all these, these sort right. of JavaScript, Java concepts, dependency injection. Um, a lot of these yeah. things that you mentioned in this article where, I mean, they could maybe work on the front end, but they're perhaps not the great, <laughs> the, the greatest option <laughs> for a specific yeah. case. And it's not only about the language, it's also about the way of doing things. So for example, it's not this use case, but on another project, uh, it was still a, a .NET and they were having all the binaries or the third libraries. They were not using Nougat to download them. They were basically um, pushing them into the source code, right? So downloading them and pushing into the source code. And then when they got to the front end, they wanted to do the same thing with node modules, right? <laughs> and well, <laughs> this cannot work. <laughs> I mean, you can do that in maybe in Java, maybe in .NET to have all your libraries uh, in the source code, but with node modules to push them, something like 600 megabytes or however we, we got there, it's uh, it's not the case. And so, uh, or other things uh, uh, were something like, you know, uh, on .NET, when you're having an array, you can use link you and you're having something like array dot uh, where function. So for filtering. 
but there is no where in the in the in the JavaScript. So what they did, they added that where function to the <laughs> to the array just to have the same feeling, the same API as it as it is in .NET. Yeah, this is a pretty egregious example, but there's some psychological research put out in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow that basically says there's two modes of thinking. One is, say, if I say what is three plus four, like you have an optimized circuit in your brain that comes up with seven pretty fast. But if I say what's 37 plus 192, you generally look to the left and sort of wait a minute and pull out your phone and start typing. And that's the system two thinking that that's a bit more difficult. It requires more energy. And, you know, as humans, we yep. try to conserve energy whenever we can, else we'll die. And so, you know, most folks would rather stick with what they know. And once you've experienced the pain and agony of becoming productive in a language, then, you know, you want to kind of stay there because it's painful to rethink right. everything all the time and not operate in a flow context. Um, I'm currently learning React now as the marketing guy. My job is to I guess learn React, so I'm doing that, and I'm experiencing this pain again of going, "Wow, none of this really uh, flows out of my brain the way that it should." I don't know if I'd go so far as to re-implementing JavaScript to use the method names that I like, but you know, I can see where that would cause a humongous problem. What What is it that happened with the dependency injection piece? Was that a piece that they needed from .NET, or was that something as part of your architecture? Well, I think they were mostly. Um... Uh, they were mostly afraid uh, of mocking things because they wanted to have unit tests, right? So in the .NET mm -hmm. world where you're having a dependency in injection, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, I imagine like it, it, it was the same thing here, just to have something at runtime, maybe they want to use a different implementation or, or things like that. That was their own, their, uh, their reasoning, right? It was not a business case like you know some companies or some user will have uh, an implementation and or a, a business uh, logic and then uh, another client have, using a different uh, strategy or things like that. Which is actually a, a, just a point while we're here too, um, which is kind of fun. Which is people anticipate solutions, and I think when you have a background, um, you do so even more. So in this case, it wasn't because they ran into a problem up front that they wanted to solve. It's because they anticipated that they would have to solve the pro same problem they did before so that they already wanted to set up. And there's good things about thinking ahead of time. Um, whether Daniel Kaiman will agree with your assessment on thinking fast or slow, Dan, we might have different agree uh, opinions on. But the uh, <laughs> but there's good things about thinking ahead of, of stuff. But there's also things about thinking about the problems you may not have. And then, you know, starting with the assumption that you will, that's very problematic. And I see a lot of people doing new languages. Yeah. I, I, it's funny to me because as a broader point, like with even with the benefit of the hindsight, it's hard to say like what the best approach here is because it's easy for us to be arrogant front end developers and say like, ha ha ha, clearly you don't know that, that we know the best way of implementing this, <laughs> right? Like, and if you just learn our ways of approaching this problem, then the world will be a better place. Like, cause there is something to be said of that approach. Like if you, if you have the background of the front end, like, there is some place for like, okay, I have the expertise here to know the best way. So on one hand, you could do that. Say like, I, I know the best way and this is the way we're gonna do it. But on the other hand, it's like, well, if this team that's being brought on will be more productive with these approaches, maybe it is better to cater to what their expertise is. Even if you know, maybe this isn't the best solution, maybe they're gonna be more productive with this. So it's hard for me to say like, and I'd be curious what you think too, like, given the benefit of of hindsight right knowing how this turns out if you would have approached this differently or uh, i guess how you might go about this because to me it's it's not necessarily clear what the best approach would have been yeah that's a good question mm -hmm. i can't wait to hear the answer <laughs> um well i don't actually know the answer here um maybe so what what is also happening I usually feel that uh, whenever the projects from .NET or from Java have to migrate uh, to, to front-end, they don't take JavaScript very seriously. So they yeah. say, okay, it's just a scripting language. So let's make it strong. Let's add uh, typings. Let's add all, uh, all the patterns. Let's add dependency injection. Just to make them feel safe that the, 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 the software will, uh, will somehow adjust uh, uh, on the way, depending on their uh, uh, on their functional requirements, maybe or, or or things like that. And 
this is what I, I, I think it, it, it is happening uh, with the guidelines. Yeah, they seem uh, like little tiny decisions that, uh, fine, inversified JS. Class yeah. components, okay. And then next thing you know, there's been a lot of micro decisions that have sort of added up. And, you know, given the politics of this where, you know, you're not the client, and the client already has an outsourcing partner that they are using, and you're just brought in to kind of knowledge transfer and get this project over the hump. It isn't exactly like you can just authoritatively declare this is how we're doing it. There's got to be some politics and some influence there. Like, was that hard for you to do? Was I mean, I think in the well, the article you reference this, but I'm curious to just to hear a bit more about your experience. Well, you can imagine that the uh, the tech lead from uh, uh, the team from India. Well, I I think they were uh, a bit afraid that they are gonna be uh, replaced, maybe. So at that time, I imagine like they wanted to prove that they are still relevant. They wanted to prove that uh, they can still bring value. So I imagine like this. Uh, they they also wanted to come up with different solutions. They will come up with the improvements just to prove that they can also contribute to the to the initial solution. So I'm also thinking about that that was also happening. They want yeah. to feel safe that they can still contribute to the solution. And maybe some of those were not really necessary, but yeah. Yeah, well, so you, you hit it there. And I want to go back to something TJ said too. First of all, you're exactly right that when I read this article, one of the first things I thought to myself was, this is a big list of people problems and it doesn't actually have a whole lot to do with technology in many cases right. because development, even though we like to make it about technology, it's really about a bunch of people that implement the technology, which is why there's so many people problems inside of it. But going back, TJ, I'm going to pick on something you said. You kept using the word best. And I swear the word best is the problem that we get into here, yeah. right? Here's two things. If I ask you to architect, architect an application that needs to live for one week and do a job and you spend a month architecting it, you're an idiot. If you have an if you have an application which needs to be around in an enterprise for ten years and you spend one day architecting it, you're an idiot. <laughs> so there is no like best solution, right? It's 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 what is the what are we trying to accomplish? And again, this was alluded to, which I think both of you did brilliantly. Who are the uh, but just push on it a little bit? Who are the people involved, right? Because honestly, you have something, but coming with a, a set of expertise. If they're willing to learn or they're interested in learning something new, cool. If they're coming in though, and hopefully you can change this, I, I get all those parts, but if they're coming in and they're worried either about the, being defensive or they are trying to stake a territory or they don't want to see a change, then choosing any technology that's going to be orthogonal to the way they do things is going to be problematic. We're going to bite that head. So it's, it's what are we trying to accomplish? Who are we trying to do it with? And like, what's our outcome? Because even those two pain points may still be worth it. If the organization said, no, we want to standardize, even if it's going to be very painful on React because we think this has the best future going forward, then maybe it's still worthwhile, although you have to do it understanding the first two are going to be problems. Um, maybe it's still worthwhile. But if uh, if it's up in the air and it's like, okay, I have a team that's not interested in learning something new and they want to do it in this very object-oriented original approach, and we should also do it in React, you are probably signing up for a lot of problems. It's a lot um, of, right a lot of change there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so we can definitely agree there are some people and political problems. I think the next section in your um, your article it sort of drifts into some of the technology choices. <laughs> this is awesome one section. I really like this section, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, this, yeah, because I, I agree that so a lot of this is people problems, but I, we could also, I mean, this section sort of gets into the technology problems. And this is actually one of my bigger, comp I don't know, like, to me, this entire thing is what makes React so great and also so horrible at the same time, yeah. just because React is far more unopinionated. You really can to get into your points here, you can use a bunch of different routers. You can do a bunch of things to working with data. You can do a bunch of different things for CSS, for all sorts of things. Um, so I'm curious, maybe you could sum up what your experiences was like this and why this was problematic for what you were working on. Yeah, well, I think React is really great and also very fun to, uh, to use. Only if you're an experienced, uh, uh, front end developer. Otherwise, if you just started on the web technologies, uh, it's gonna be very hard for you to take to 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 make all those decisions, right? 
And this is what actually was a, was a pain point for us because even though I already had the, that proof of concept in place, I had to uh, go through all those decisions and uh, and uh, yeah, show uh, to the other team and actually discuss about why I picked that one and why not the other one and, 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 and things like that. And uh, that actually took a lot of time, I would say. Uh, also, a lot of documentation that I had to, to put down why uh, those decisions were made. And more than that, uh, other, I mean, um, all those libraries, uh, they had to be learned by uh, uh, all the members from the team. Uh, and that, again, took, uh, took a lot of time. Um, and it was, it was quite challenging. Yeah, going back to Mike's point from earlier, like it, choosing the best libraries is going to be very difficult. Really, what you can pick is what's the best series of trade-offs. I've got a question on that. And, it, and this is an, a, totally an opinion one, because it's interesting something you said that React is hard to learn if you're a new web developer. I almost yep. wonder, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, is it harder to learn if you know a little bit about web stuff so that you kind of already have an opinion? And does that make it harder? Or if somebody sat you down and you didn't have any experience at all and just said, this is how it works, would it actually be hard? Or is it just what we know that makes it hard? <laughs> so I started the React, actually, I think, I think it was four years ago. The first project that I, uh, I did was a failure uh, because I did all, all kinds of mistakes. Lucky for me, it was just a personal project. So it was not a commercial one. Um, <laughs> And this was because uh, even though uh, everyone said, okay, you should use React with Redux. Okay, you, you, you'll go and try to implement it as they say, but uh, uh, I still did a lot of mistakes. For example, I did not um, uh, denormalize the state in, in Redux. And then I got to all kinds of uh, issues uh, while I was uh, uh, changing the state. So, but at the end, you know, uh, 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 I understood those uh, mistakes, and then I uh, was able to uh, to you know identify those and also learn from them. While if you're kind of a junior, well, it would be pretty hard uh, to detect those uh, uh, those challenges, and you basically go on that way for for a long time without noticing that you're going on the wrong way. This is what, how, how, uh, how I feel it. So if you do know a bit of uh, front end, well, I'm not sure if, uh, if it's going to help you a lot. You, you need to have, I mean, you, you need to be more like almost senior to, uh, to detect those, uh, those mistakes. You know, what's interesting too is you know, I, we had mentioned the first bit of this, we talked about people problems and then moved on to like technology problems. But to me, some of these things also get into like potential people problems because really like for all of these types of questions chances are you could just pick one and probably in the grand scheme of things you're going to be successful more or less regardless of your decisions i think it, there it, that's not 100 percent true but i think for the most part you could just pick one and be successful but all of these are potential areas of conflict <laughs> within teams right like if team b says like well but we really you know we think this router and we've, we've tried it out and we think it's, it's better Then all of a sudden now you have like an internal debate of like, which one to use when really it probably doesn't matter which router you use with react. Um, so I'm curious if, um, you've ran into that and Mike, I'm also curious too, like, if you have like recommendations for like companies that run into this, like, is it best if people like just say like as a standard as a company these are our decisions and what we go with or like is it best to leave it up to individual teams i'm, I'm curious what sort of practices you all would recommend around this i'm going to actually let her have go first on this one uh and then uh, i'll kind of back into it and, and here's why right i don't know that there's a good answer to what you said and i uh but i'd like to actually think it'd be fun to talk about but i'm curious in in your mind how much of this just going with what tj said ended up being arguments over just because they were arguments because it was people trying to stake claims or how much you was ended up being really technical arguments on these just out of curiosity uh so i'm not sure how to i'm not sure how to say uh, 
I, I think, I mean, uh, there were a lot of technical decisions, um, but we we uh, initially, uh, you know, when when a when a .NET project, for example, or a .NET team tries to uh, tries to use uh, the, uh, the the front end, well, they go to, for example. Uh, React or Angular uh, page, and they see you know that okay, React is very fast, is very easy to use, and they follow that pattern, but they don't really uh, notice or they don't really expect that over the time it it will be very challenging, right? So, uh, and most than that, more than that, also the libraries that they are going to use. Uh, they, um, uh, the, the libraries that they are going to use, they believe that it's the same thing like it's in .NET or Java, right? So they think that, okay, you will have to, uh, uh, you, you'll, you basically can, uh, can rely on that library for, for a long time. And that was, um, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, was, uh, very, uh, strange for, uh, for this company because they did not expect uh, that there were so many uh, libraries that did, that are involved, and honestly, I it, it, they did not also expect that they have to do some maintenance over the time because those libraries need to be maintained. Those libraries need need to be um, uh, to run. I don't know some kind of uh, risk audit, uh, uh, and from time to time you have to spend. You, you have to spend some time to uh, to upgrade those and uh, make sure that they they are still on uh, on your roadmap. I would say. So TJ, to answer your kind of question on how we go about this, it, it's two things and it's tricky, but it's where we can have seams and where we can what we call bracket concerns. So if let's say, and not that it should be this way, but let's say that there's some specialized feature. And so I'm, I'm making this up a little bit intentionally because I want to make the most ludicrous example I can. But um, if let's say that your, your router choice is going to completely define how your application works, then it's absolutely necessary that we make that up front. But if we can basically say, we're going to kind of create a seam and the concerns of the router are going to be over here, then we could go with the simplest thing that could work for right now. Because as long as we don't tightly couple it in, we can probably change that if somebody has a really good reason to, to do so again in the future. So it's about which concerns we can bracket off and sort of say, we can have something good enough and which concerns we have to say like, no, we need to, we absolutely need to know this now because it is, uh, and I, I love the line, like, come on, man, it, there's no way it takes three weeks to pick these libraries. No, it can take way more than three weeks if, if, if it's really <laughs> like what's what's happening and people are, are arguing about them. But the question is, is that, uh, I like, uh, and I will reference back to Dan's point, like we all have limited energy to spend. Uh, I would so much rather focus in on the arguments we have to have and then try to set aside the ones that we can, you know, kind of defer to or make the simplest choice we could. So that's more or less what I recommend to teams. Yeah, if you if call initially something like four years ago, uh, before the TypeScript world, it was the flow type, uh, if you've used it before. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was not involved in that project, but uh, another project in, in my company was starting with flow uh, type. And um, now after four years, well, they, they wish they had a different decision, right? If we only had a crystal ball to see forward, you know, we could make all the perfect decisions now. I think, I think that's sort of the challenge of writing any sort of article like this is because the answer to should you use X is always it depends. Like there's <laughs> the, anything in the tech world. And so because of that, I think people always want the super clear answer. Like, oh, in this case, I should definitely use this, this framework or this sub library or something like that. When in, in reality, there's never going to be an article that's going to give you a definitive answer. And really like we're paid to help try to make these decisions intelligently based off the circumstance, the the people, the the tech, the requirements, all that sort of thing. I think also the time frame too. I also like what you said, Mike, of like focusing on the decisions that matter. So sometimes, like I think it's good to take a step back if you're in one of these debates and think like, okay, how much does this actually matter, right? Because there are times where it absolutely does. If you're setting off to build something big that you know is going to be around for a long time, then yeah, maybe like what framework, what approach you take for this really does matter. Whereas if you're just 
choosing between like one little small decision on one page or one little like how should you should format things in those cases you know maybe have a discussion but let's not uh let's not try to make a huge debate and thing out of something if it really is kind of trivial well you know the the opposite of trivial is important and during this process react yeah. hooks got popular so what happened there uh, <laughs> nice segue like, man. like that, that was like, awesome. uh, <laughs> Segway, segway machine here. That was that was that was impressive. I'll give you that. <laughs> Before you get into hooks, I did want to bring in. We had a couple of good points in chat that I just want to break up. So um, this is Dev. Oh, this is Jalen. Okay, hey Jalen. Uh, in his opinion, it'd be easier to learn React if you knew nothing at all, since you have no other previous context, which I think is interesting. And I kind of agree. Like if you just sat somebody down and just said, "Hey, this is how you build web apps." Right, like I think it removes some of the complexity. I'm gonna put a little asterisk on that though, which I think is is goes to a point. I think it would be it's gonna depend on your background too. Like if you are coming from a really strictly object oriented background, and then somebody sat you down, even with no web experience, and said React, yeah. I think it's a harder thing. If you maybe had some functional or some understanding of like how functions and functional stuff relates, I think it would be easier to sit somebody down and say like okay, go work on React. Not that everything in React is perfectly functional. Or it's not, I'm not trying to get that debate. Just saying some of the things they draw from without some background, I can understand would be complex anyway. Yep, and actually that leads into this point from uh, Dr. Replica. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly, but- D Replica main. D Replica main, gotcha. That learning React from the basics can help break out, break up the break down the methodologies in JavaScript and other front end related tools, which I agree with as well. I've I've been doing JavaScript for a long time and actually learning React taught me some things about JavaScript that I didn't know from years of doing it. So I, I agree with that as well. All right, I wanted to make sure that, and if you have any points in chat, feel free to chime in. And if you have any questions too, because um, we can take this in a lot of different directions, feel free to chime in as well. But I'll toss it back over to Razvan here as well. To I'm curious your thought on hooks in this point here. Yeah, you're nine months in, you're a good chunk <laughs> away from the application and all of a sudden, something changes. And I love this line here, the team has mixed feelings. Like that is five words with a period, but there's a lot to that. So <laughs> kind of walk through what's going on. Yeah, so initially we had the uh, functional and class components. And then um, at that point, I don't think React uh, Hooks was actually experimental at all. It was not announced yet. Uh, but uh, after a while, it got popular, and now all the developers who noticed those patterns, well, they wanted to use uh, in the project, right? All the tutorial that uh, uh, they found on the, on the for the libraries that we were using, they started using hooks. So that's uh, that was quite tricky because uh, there were actually two solutions one of them was to say okay we will ban those we were not going to use those or the other solution was okay uh, let's try to use those for the new pages because going back and migrate all those 50 pages that we uh, we've done already was not the case and at this point i think we got into a mixed uh, uh, architecture uh, and it was mostly it, i mean that was not a, a, a big problem, right? So the, the components are uh, written in, in different way. It was more like a change in the mindset of where should you keep the state? Because initially we said, okay, we will keep all the state in the, uh, in the uh, Redux and then we will adopt hooks because it's uh, very easy and it gets uh, uh, away from the high order components and then we noticed that most of the state, instead of going to Redux, it ac actually ended up in the page or actually into the components. And then the problem was that it uh, really um, um, ignored our initial guidelines where we said, okay, we will have dumb components and, and, and smart components. And now we, will busy, we had something like a mix between those. The, those components were also smart, I would say. And... Uh, yeah, that's how we, we ended up in using uh, three ways. It seems like that would be very difficult to write software in because things can kind of be anyway. It's almost like a choose your own architecture path. Mike, you were nodding your head. Did you have a something to toss in there? Uh, I'm laughing because it actually goes back to your previous point, which is the idea that like a lot of people believe, and this is 
this is really crazy when you come to the JavaScript world um, and maybe quite a bit different than others is that there's things are continually changing, right? Um, I'm laughing actually mostly because I was at a conference. I don't know about an hour after hooks was like finally officially released. And the first person that got up on stage and said, well, my topic's not particularly new. I know everyone's been, you know, using hooks, but I thought I'd show you some finer points before we move on to the new stuff. Um, and uh, in the world that we live in, that's kind of how this stuff goes, right? And so where, there's a lot of decisions to be made there, but I do think it's interesting that it, every, every software, versions of .NET, versions of it, there's always changes and there's always migrations. But I think it's probably bigger here in the sense that you're talking about changes in how you approach the core architecture of what you're doing and it changes much more frequently. Um, so I was mostly laughing because, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult situation to be in. And it does, in fact, bring up, and I was particularly smiling because it is the biggest debate. Like if you were going to have one debate with people who've really seriously architected big applications, it would be where does my state belong and is all state equal and what state's really transient and what state should be here for real and what should be in a store. Like those are the real debates, right? And hooks just happen to bring those right front and center. So you have to argue about them earlier rather than later which is good and bad, but being in the middle of trying to have those arguments and try to convince people why they may or may not be good and be in the middle of a project and trying to change things, that doesn't sound fun at all. <laughs> There's a great comment there, TJ. Yeah, uh, Cedar says, I was shamed for a job interview for not knowing to use hooks less than a year <laughs> after it had been released. And I totally sympathize with that. And I usually tell people, just as a just general advice, like I never, it's always a bad idea. I shouldn't say always. It's almost always a bad idea to just upgrade something from like one syntax to the next just because, right? Like if there's no actual reason, because usually you don't want to change code because there's potentially unintended consequences of messing with things. You should have some reason to do it. So I think that's actually what's interesting about this scenario is actually there is a legit reason that like hooks actually ties into the core way you're managing state and such. So it's not just like a syntax discussion, but it's actually deep down into like the core of how the app works and functions. I well, also want to point the, out the political environment here, if I can just make some educated guesses. So you're part of the way through the project. The management is concerned about time and materials and budget. There's a certain amount of milestones that are being hit. Some are being missed because that's how projects go. And there may be a little bit of pressure at this point. So stopping and redoing everything in hooks isn't going to work. There's no budget to redo no. stuff that works. Um, how's the development we, going right now at this part of the process? Yeah, well, I mean, at that point, we we, uh, we said, okay, we will start uh, using hooks for the new pages. And maybe sometime we will have the time to go back and uh, uh, <laughs> adjust those pages uh, on the way, well, this is never happening. Maybe for some of the pages uh, that had to be, uh, you know, changed a bit or things like that. Maybe they were, if they were touched, they were also migrated and then retested and so on. But uh, most of the time, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you cannot go to a, a product owner and say, hey, you know what? I need six months of migrating uh, uh, those pages that are working at this moment. Right. So. Although it is a hard thing to do, and I get it, it sometimes though that has to also help make the decision, right? Like if 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 the business, if the people involved say like, no, we're not willing to spend the extra money to to migrate or go this direction. Sometimes, even though it's not the fun thing to do as a developer, what that sometimes means is you need to stay the course too and say, yeah, we're right. gonna we're gonna go ahead and finish up on this version, and then you will have to plan some upgrade path in the future because that's the right way to go. And that can be really painful as a developer when you feel like there's a better way to do something. But honestly, in big projects, sometimes that's what's necessary too. You need some kind of oh. consistency because someone's got to go back in later and try to make this thing work <laughs> again. On the other hand, you, you, we are talking here about enterprises and usually uh, every product owner, they just want to get uh, the product ship uh, so they can uh, usually get a bonus or something. And then... <laughs> Most of the time, after after the product is released, they uh, move to another company. So they, it's <laughs> another another manager's problem to migrate uh, a legacy code, right? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> this this comment from D Replica is also really good. So when I'm on a project, the main their maintainer uses class components. And we had a debate. So whenever you see functional components, that's my code, and class components was his code. <laughs> 
Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, maybe one of these days he'll catch one of these episodes, but a, a good friend of mine and a developer, Ben, it's not this severe, but we didn't agree on coding style. And so there was a passive aggressive war for like two years where every time I would commit something, he would check it back out, fix the coding style and then push it back up. Um, and so basically every time I did anything on my own PRs, I'd find merge conflicts. Uh, but the, uh, but I'm amused by it because like I've seen things get that bad in teams that like don't have a good focus where people are literally like tweaking each other's code underfoot because they don't agree on strategies. And again, I tend, it's just where I work, right? I tend to see the people problems, but man, there, it can happen and, and teams can get kind of vicious on this stuff. It, it's, it's tricky. It's yeah, <laughs> this is not an easy situation. It's, it's another thing. The chat is uh, knocking out of the park today. This one's really good from Cedo. Or less important whether you choose class functional components and more important that everybody on the team chooses a pattern and sticks with it consistently. And I, I like that quite a bit. And I think too, that like sometimes I've had to be the person that like bites the bullet and does something I don't like. And like, I used to always be a, a tabs and double quotes type of person just because that's like how I started up in the Java world. That's just what people did. And the JavaScript world is very much two spaces for, for indentation, single quotes for strings. And it took me the longest time to be okay with it. But it's funny that once I started doing it, like now that's what the, 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 what I do. Right. And that's like, now, if I go back to going back to double quotes and such that messes with me. So it's <laughs> just, just change them every other work. line. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do well, like the one cool. comment that just came into about future maintainability, but our future maintenance, but go ahead. Sorry. It was fun. What I can add to that comment is that, um, Whenever those uh, enterprise are working with outsourcing company, uh, there is a there is a, a bigger um, developer churn, right? Because in outsourcing, well, most of the, it happens more often to uh, for a developer to to leave, and then another developer comes in, and you can imagine the same thing uh, happened to us, and then you know a new developer comes in and they notice, oh, you're still having functional components. Oh, you're not using React hooks. So that's also, again, something that uh, it's not uh, it's not very fancy, especially for the new developer when they notice, okay, I'm going to work in this project. Yeah. Well, I think this is one of the things that, you know, it's very easy to be academic and say consistency, but you knew that was the right decision and you weren't able to get it done. Like you've got code that was sh basically shipped. It's done. The product owner knows it's finished. It's written in one way. Now there's a new way. Then there's developers that want to kind of do it their way and you don't control these developers. And yep. I mean, what looking back, what could you have done differently to try to get some kind of handle on that? Or was it really just a lost cause? Well, unfortunately for me, I was not really, even though initially I was uh, mo the most responsible guy uh, for this project, I never got the authority, right? Because I was working as an outsourcer, a consultant more. So w what I would have done differently initially at the project, when uh, when the, the other team joined the, the project, I would say, okay, let's have a matrix with, you know, a, a Rachi matrix, right? Who is responsible, who has the authority and who will be consultant. At that point, we didn't have. So it, more, it was more like a distributed responsibility. No one wanted to take the decision <laughs> because, yeah, they were afraid or they want to. They didn't want to disturb the other guys. So I think that was missing for, for this project. Someone who said, okay, let's go in that path and I'll be responsible. The, the interrelationship between responsibility and authority tanks more projects than any technological choice that you will ever come up with. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> and the worst case scenario is when you have responsibility and no authority. <laughs> That's the right. worst. <laughs> I, I think I think I, I got into that trap, right? Yeah. <laughs> with no authority. So. You know, there's there's one thing, and Uncle and I don't Ben said this. this. He was comment. very very clear about this. I, I, I when he when Uncle Ben let me know that. All right. Yeah, there's one other item in your your article that I want to make sure we have time for, and that's what happens when libraries are deprecated, because in the React world it is vibrant, and lots of things do change, and new solutions come up all the time, and and that's honestly what makes React such a great ecosystem. But at the same time, like. What do you do if, if a library you depend on is deprecated? How did that affect the team and, and, and your project? 
the problem here is that the, uh, the guys who just joined the front end world, well, they are not aware that uh, tech, that libraries are getting deprecated more often than it happens on the back end, right? So that's that's one of the things, and I think we uh, we should create more awareness that hey, if you're going to this game in the front end, well, things are going much faster than it is on, on the back end. Uh, so basically, uh, I would just create this awareness. I would say to the product owner, hey, uh, you know, uh, we are going to take some decisions. And then it might happen that in three years, uh, some of the, the libraries will get deprecated and we need to take some actions uh, for, uh, for those. Lucky, I feel that in, uh, especially on the front end world, um, projects don't go deprecated overnight. It, usually there is, you will notice those projects that they are maintained uh, uh, very less and uh, you basically can um, can see like okay in one year i i imagine like this project was not we're not going to be uh, maintained anymore so you can create some plans for it uh, maybe you know either replace it with something else or maybe you can try to maintain it yourself for your project and in some cases that's what we did we fork the, the original project and we try to to keep it for uh, for our own needs uh, of course you don't want to get into the other side where you don't uh, pick any uh, project any other outsource uh, library because you're afraid that it's going to be deprecated it's going to cost you more than that and uh, it's not a good idea to implement it uh, to implement those things uh, on your own so I would say it 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 really depends. Um, it also depends on um, uh, maybe before adopting it, maybe you have to ask yourself, "Hey, do I really need this?" Because that's what actually happened in my case. I picked uh, React, uh, Redux Saga, and uh, to be honest, it was not really necessary. I mean, it adds a lot of complexity, and I think it was a, a mistake from my side. Uh, initially, they said that, okay, I might need uh, uh, more complicated business logic, like okay, things like uh, event funneling or uh, all that kind of stuff or events that are coming up from, from the server. And I think just a, a, a thunk would have been a, a better decision in that sense. I also know that uh, uh, there are a lot, a lot of big libraries or maybe medium libraries that are being introduced into the project just because they need one utility from that project itself now yeah. again do you really need to to do this or not maybe you should maybe you maybe you can just you know copy paste from the source code of that library pick that utility and add it to your project and i've seen a lot of uh, projects that are using uh, lodash which is very popular but only three or four utilities are being used from those and Usually it's the map or the filter and they already exist in the array, right? So, yeah. Yeah, Maybe chats went a little crazy, but um, <laughs> Mike, do you have any any thoughts or feelings around this? Oh, I'm with you. But I think there's one other thing too that's not well understood and although uh, you alluded to it, is that any project that in JavaScript on the front end that is gonna go on for a significant period of time is gonna have changes. And one of the things that doesn't happen is that the people who generally quote the projects or who are running them aren't aware of that because maybe they came from a background technology or they came from an old side. So part of where we get into trouble is they aren't planning that into the budget and the timeline. And if we can do a better job of and I'm going to say educating, but really what I mean is trying to convince and plea our case in some cases, but make people understand that in the course of a project that's six months long, the odds that we're going to have to revisit something and change something is probably 100%. Um, <laughs> that will uh, that may help a lot more than it being a surprise because the thing that, and I, I get this, everyone does, right? But the thing that project managers and product owners hate the most are surprises. So if we can start sh you know, uh, shopping that stuff on day one, it helps a little bit. Um, yeah. 
but I am so, so with you and I'm laughing because I'm sure the people from my company that are listening to this uh, have been waiting for me to chime in because I hate when we use giant libraries for one function so much <laughs> that I'm having a visceral reaction right now <laughs> and my heart rate's higher. Um, so I am with you. I would so much rather copy three lines of code and have to maintain it than I would to have an external dependency for the next four years of my life for you know six lines of code I could have written in an afternoon. It's so easy to add a dependency to a project and so hard to carry it forward. Well, I think too that you mentioned, <laughs> like, well, we yeah. talked in terms of like a project being deprecated, but sometimes like even what you ran into with Redux, Redux, um, you almost, by using it at scale, you almost realize that something's not the right decision. I think this is also super common because it's easy yeah. to think like, oh, before I get, it's one thing to think of projects the best when you haven't started actually getting into the the weeds, into the nitty gritty of implementing it. Because so often it's, I'm I'm now like, I'm not realizing now that I'm scaling something up, I'm looking at a different side of this dependency than what I started with. And I think that's also super common. So I like, Mike, your point of like, just building that in because it's not just deprecation. It could also be just like, as we build this up, we realize, hey, if we took, a couple of days here to switch up our approach, then we're going to be far more productive for the second half, two thirds of this project sort of thing too. Yeah. And it's hard because a lot of people aren't, don't have experience and this was nailed. Uh, Rosin said exactly right. Most of the folks that are coming to this and a lot of the new influx into front end technologies are people who came from other development backgrounds. So it might be weird, right? Like you take somebody who's a C developer and standard IO changes, I don't know, once every 10 years or so. Um, <laughs> and tell them that, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and, and, do something that's a moving target that between installs of your packages, like if you look at your package lock, like 30% of everything changed, that might freak them out just a little bit. Um, but at the same time, we're also kind of not being honest if we don't at least try to surface that because it's going to happen. And I might add, as somebody who's primarily in our large enterprise applications, responsible for hunting down what went wrong every time Babel and Terser get slightly out of whack and something goes crazy in our build, um, these things happen. And if you don't plan some time for them, <laughs> you, you can't stay on track. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a generic, I think, front end problem too. I don't think this is necessarily a React thing because Babel and Webpack and Tursor problems exist in Angular, they exist in Vue. Sure. So if like you're using a modern web app stack, it's just for yeah. for better or worse, it's the nature of the beast, I think, at the moment. Some could even call it complex. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been this has been awesome, Razvan. Uh, if we're coming up in our time, I I just wanted to ask you: Is there anything you think that we we haven't covered, or anything we haven't get into that you you wanna that you think we should bring up here before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think I think that was all. Maybe what I could I, I also want to mention about uh, uh, React is that I I see a lot of you know this comparison between React and uh, Angular and it's not only React right you also, you need to compare React plus the router plus the state plus versus uh, Angular and um, you know, maybe uh, something that I I wish from uh, from the React team um, maybe they can uh, collaborate more or maybe they can somehow redirect uh, uh, some of those CTOs uh, to more opinionated frameworks like Next.js or, or Gatsby. And maybe, I don't know, maybe they can also intake some of the development of those libraries, like the same approach that Vue.js had, right? So instead of having a separate router, maybe they can integrate into the React ecosystem itself, even though it's an optional package that you can opt in to, to include. Uh, maybe that's that's also a solution. Um, and another thing that I might want to mention is uh, uh, about Svelte. I feel that Svelte has a has a nice approach. So they uh, it's still a, a simple library, right? But if you want to use you know a, um, a web application, they can basically direct you. Hey, if you want to use a web application, use Sapper for or another boilerplate for it. So maybe React team can, uh, uh, can have a same, the same approach here instead of having just React. Yep, totally agreed. Well, this has been great. Uh, one thing we'd like to end with is just like picks or shout outs. And Razvan, I'd be curious if you start, like if people want to reach out, if they have any other questions for you, what's the, the best place to do that? Because I think we have some other questions. 
coming in here as well. So if people want to reach out, uh, what's a good place for that? If they want to reach out to me, they can uh, uh, reach me on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, and also if they want to read my uh, uh, new year's resolution for this year, because I started <laughs> blogging actually this January, like uh, 9th of January, I think it was the first blog post. Uh, they can uh, follow me on um, uh, on Medium. Yeah, I think they should because you know the topic you've chosen is uh, not a topic that's talked about a lot, and enterprise development is hard. And I basically right. just want to say thanks for your openness and honesty. Like you've come forward with what you felt you could do better, and you talked about your project in a way that I think people can learn from. And most people aren't comfortable talking about their failures, and 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 you actually did. And um, it's a great fanfare. By the way, what was the total reader count on the Medium article? Was it has it hit a quarter million yet? No, no. Uh, so it's around one hundred sixty thousand uh, so, so far in in two weeks. Well, I did not expect. That, but it's, like, it's gonna go in, on Twitter and and so on. I, I think I would add more details about okay, uh, what are the reasoning behind it, and especially on the conclusion, because I feel like I got into a instead of you know me uh, describing the mistakes that I did, I felt like I ended up in, into a war between react and angular right so a lot of comments were like yeah react sucks and you should not use react <laughs> and i'm not so react fans i imagine they are saying oh it's not react's fault it's your fault it's your management fault you don't know to use it and so on so well, they'll uh, love the part two whenever you decide to write it and let us know because yeah, i'll pump it out maybe, too. maybe i can aggregate those uh, uh those comments and uh, have some answers for them and uh, write the version to react <laughs> it's awesome. it, it's funny for from years of doing this it's you never know which things are going to take off and it's always the things you least expect too so right. that that happens all the time it's kind of just funny how it works yeah yeah as i mentioned now after it got a, a bit of viral i would say now i'm actually afraid to write new articles <laughs> no, no. nobody came to your house to beat, up, to beat you up i mean that's fine and yeah. I, I think you know what you're talking about and i think you did a really good job on it so i thought it was a good read um i circulated around because i did and i think a lot of the reason you're getting so many reads is that although yes you'll always get hate mail a lot of people identify with it and there's a lot of folks out there in the world right now you know, Dan and I talk about this a little bit, and I know we're over time, but just to quickly put it out there, not everybody in the world who's working on big systems for enterprises calls themselves a React enterprise developer. And so one of the yeah. tricks is that it's really hard to get people to identify where they have common problems. And one of the things I think you did really well is that you wrote something that a whole bunch of people who may not have used those words came together and found one place to talk about them. And so, yeah, it was awesome. And if you put out a part two, uh, line me up. I'm reading it. It'll be great. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In one place they could read about it. Dan, do you want to drop in your plug here? Talk about <laughs> Captain Segway. Yeah, yeah, I'll plug the newsletter again. So our developers submit all the articles for it. So they're developer approved, the Enterprise React newsletter. So drop that oh. in chat. Uh, it's a great place to check out React content. And then <laughs> transitions are on fire today. And then I'll, <laughs> I'll wrap up with the tossing in the React Wednesdays homepage. Once again, we got a calendar there you can subscribe to. We got paid meeting house next week. So if you want to hear more enterprise React goodness, we've got another show on that next week. So check that out, add it to your calendar and such. But Razvan, I'll just give you one last thank you from us. Thanks again for joining us. This is a lot of fun. Thank you for awesome. having me. All right. See everybody until Have next week. Bye.